You would think that I would give a sermon on something that has to do with <laughs> Tisha B'Av, but that's not what I did. Um, I wrote this thinking that my father was going to be out of pocket, so this was written before we were approaching Tisha B'Av, so, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to use what I got. Um, just one thing, and I know this is kind of interesting. You know how I've said many times in my sermons that I'm preaching to myself? Well, this morning, or just now in praise, God was taking me through what I'm going to be presenting to you today and going, you need to deal with this, you need to deal with this, you need to deal with this. And what you're going to see today is actually what I'm going to be dealing with is something that is almost a closed circuit, if you know what that is. Something that basically one thing feeds into one thing, another thing that feeds another, and then it comes back around over and over again. And it's one of those things that if you get one part wrong, it starts to corrupt the next part, which then corrupts the next part, and then corrupts the next part. So the conviction to, you need to fix this, 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 and this, it kind of, kind of the circuit's there. So know, know that as I am presenting this, I am human, and I need, need it as much as you do. Today's, uh, oh, Today's date is July 29th, 2017, and it is Av 6, 57, 77 on the Jewish calendar. And the name of my message today is In Hot Pursuit. And what this sermon is going to be, and I'm sorry for those who are visiting, because this is actually, it's kind of interesting how this is going to be presented. Um, because of my, my message on pursuing peace, it then got my parents and I talking and wondering, okay, what all should we be pursuing? What does it say in Scripture to pursue? So I started studying that out. What I found as I studied this out, and I've said this, I've said this before, I've said that I've been noticing this pattern. And I said this before too, I've been doing a series and I didn't even know it. <laughs> and once again, I came back to the same scriptures that I've been presenting multiple times for all these different topics and finding the topics are there sandwiched all together. All these different topics I've been presenting are found in capsules together in one scripture. I just focused in on one or another or another and these things are contained <laughs> it's just, uh, and I'm, I'm going to be getting really excited. I'm hoping that you guys can actually track with where I'm going. Because this is a circuit, a closed circuit, there's going to be a lot of this leads to that, which leads to this, which leads to that, and then we get back, you know. So hopefully, hopefully you can track. Um, being that we're talking about what you need to pursue, I'm going to t be touching once again on pursuing peace because it's one of the things we are to pursue. And I started realizing there's all these scriptures I've used before, I could have used again, and it would have worked. So, uh, the w one of the things I thought of, if anyone's like a big fan of any kind of show, you ever watch the whole season and then they have that one episode that's like a recap of what has happened throughout the show? This is going to be kind of that, but hopefully good, because no one likes those, show, those episodes in the show. <laughs> so hopefully this will be good. Um, so where I want to start is in 1 Timothy. Well, that I haven't told you exactly in 1 Timothy where I was going, so hold on. <laughs> 1 Timothy 6, which is page 1484 in the Complete Jewish Bible. And I'm going to be focusing in on 611, but I actually want to read the whole thing because the context actually is very interesting. So... Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and start reading. Those who are under the yoke of slavery should regard their masters as worthy of full respect, so that the name of God and the teaching, and the teaching will not be brought into dispute. And those who have believing masters are not to show them less respect on the, on the ground that they are brothers. On the contrary, they should serve all the more, delighting since those benefiting from the service are believers whom they love. 
Teach and exhort people about these things. If anyone teaches differently and does not agree to the sound precepts of our Lord Yeshua the Messiah and to the doctrine that is in keeping with godliness, he is swollen with content, conceit and understands nothing. Instead, he has a morbid, and th this is where things get interesting, instead he has a morbid desire for controversies and word battles, out of which come jealousy, dissension, insults, evil suspicions, and constant wrangling among people whose minds no longer function properly and who have been deprived of the truth so that they imagine that religion is a road to riches. So right here, I'm going to point this out, already, several times in these, these messages I've been giving, there is the concept that how we communicate, how we speak to each other is paramount. How we deal with each other is paramount. And right here it talks about controversies and word battles. And what did I talk about? I talked about peace last time. This is in contrary to peace. This is the opposite of peace. Now, debating something civilly, that's one thing. That's not what's being described here. And then it goes on to say that these people get to a place where they imagine that religion is somehow something that will lead to riches. What did I talk about? About God doesn't have to love you. God wants to love you. The whole concept of entitlement. This idea that somehow religion is going to lead to riches. Do we have that in our nation at all? Nah. So already, we have ties back to things I have talked about. That these are in contrary to what I'm about to present, about what we are to pursue. This is in contrary to that. No true religion does... Uh, not, oh, yeah. Now, true religion does bring great riches, but only to those who are content with what they have. So we have brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. So if we have food and clothing, we will be satisfied with these. Furthermore, those whose goal is to be rich fall into temptation. They get trapped in many foolish and hurtful ambitions, which plunge them into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all evils. Because of this craving, some people have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves to the heart with many pains. And this ties back to the fact that my father keeps bringing up the seeds. This is one of the problems where the seeds get... Uh, choked off by the concerns of the world, by what's around you, by what you want. These are the weeds. And the weeds have thistles. And what the thistles do, they pierce to the heart with many pains. This is only going to cause you pain. It's basically what he said. This, this way of thinking is only going to cause you pain, people. And here we go. So this is contrary to what God says to do. But you, as a man of God, flee from these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faithfulness, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you testified so well to your faith before many witnesses. I charge you before God who gives life to all things and before the Messiah Yeshua, who in his witness to Pontius Pilate gave the same good testimony to obey your commission spotlessly and irreproachably until our Lord Yeshua and Messiah appears. He his appearing will be brought about in its own time by the blessed and sole sovereign who is King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal, who dwells in unreproachable light that no human being has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal power. Amen. As for those who do have riches in their present world, charge them not to be proud and not to let their hope rest on the uncertainties of riches, but to rest their hope on God, who richly provides us with all things for our enjoyment. Charge them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous and ready to share. In this way they will treasure up for themselves a good foundation for the future, so that they may lay hold of real life. Uh, I love that. The, the riches aren't real life. You need to lay hold of to real life. O oh, Timothy, keep safe what has been entrusted to you. Turn away from the ungodly babbling. Once again, here's that whole babbling and argumentative opposition of what is false called knowledge. So once again, that call to 
let's not get in senseless arguments. For many who promise this knowledge have missed the mark as far as the faith is concerned. Grace be with you. So, let's look at 6.11. And the thing is, I think it's interesting with the DDK, and Dad studying the DDK, he, he brought up the fact that he was going to be bringing something that was more scholastic than his typical, and whereas he's more admonition. In this case, I'm going to be doing something a little more scholastic. We're going to be doing, looking at the words, actually the meaning of the words. Now, because of my character, it's probably going to turn to admonition anyway. But, we're going to, admonition anyway. <laughs> but, let's look at the meanings. Let's start off with pursue. What does it mean to pursue? Well, the Greek for pursue, and of course I'm probably going to botch most of these words. Pursue is dioko. D-I-O-K-O. And if you're wanting the spelling of these words, I will let you take a look at the manuscript. Um, some of these words get quite long. I'd have to repeat them a couple times for you to be able to write them all down. Um, anyway, dioko. Now, I, I do want to say, in the definition, there is a connotation of um, being pursued so as to be um, persecuted. The idea that someone's pursuing you, someone's dogging you, wanting to persecute you. So there is that. So there's a contextual understanding of this. But that's not what I want to focus on, and that's not the context. It's saying what you are to pursue, what you're to go after. So, in that context, it means to run swiftly in order to catch a person or thing. Well, if you remember when I talked about peace, it's, it's like hunting something down. It's not there. It's elusive. You have to go get it. And you have to go get it, you have to go get it with some oomph to run after, to press on, figuratively, figuratively of one who is in a race, run swiftly to reach the goal. I like this one, to pursue in a hostile manner. Go after it, not oh, go get it. it says, go after it, get it, come on. You know how the coaches see someone running, like come on, go, 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 go. It's that. Metaphor, to pursue, to seek after eagerly, earnestly endeavor to acquire. These are things that we must earnestly endeavor to acquire. Now, I used before Psalms 34.14 for peace, which said, seek peace and go after it, or seek peace and pursue it. This is that pursue, except it's in Hebrew, which that's, we're going to get to that. And in the Hebrew is radaf. In English, the transliteration is R-A-D-A-P-H. To be behind. Obviously, if you're pursuing something, you're behind it. Follow after. Pursue. Once again, there's persecute. Run after. To pursue. Put to flight. Which, th that's not this context either. I like this. Chase dog. You're dogging it. Doggedly chasing after it. You dog after this thing until you get it attend closely upon. So there's one side that is chasing, the other one is you attend to it, you focus in on it, you look at it. Once again, persecute or harass, not the context. To follow after, aim to secure. This is what you are to aim to secure. And it said to run after, and then in brackets says a bribe, but I think it might have actually meant to be a bride, almost, I'm not sure. I don't really understand that. If it is a bribe, I don't get the context. Uh, to be pursued. One pursued. Once again, so there's that whole being pursued part. To pursue ardently. Aim eagerly to secure. Once again, pursue. Uh, once again, to be pursued or chased. And to pursue or chase. But once again, I, I, I love the whole dog attend closely to, aim to secure. And uh, one of the things I want to look at too is in that scripture it says seek peace and go after it, or seek peace and pursue it. Well, what's seek? Well, seek is uh, bakash, B-A, and they have it B-A-Q-A-S-H, bakash. I'm thinking the Q is actually a kof. I, they didn't have the Hebrew, so I didn't get to look at that. To seek, require, 
desire. You are to desire peace. Exact peace. I like that. You're not just to desire it. You're to be the one who's exacting peace, bringing it forth. Request to seek to find, to seek to secure, to seek the face. To seek the face of peace. Who is the face of peace? but the one who brings forth peace by destroying chaos. So I like that, to seek the face, to desire, to demand, demand peace, to require, once again, to exact, to ask, to request, to be sought. So you are to desire and demand peace and then pursue peace with hostile intent, <laughs> which is kind of an interesting, but you are to go get it. Also, 1 Peter 3, which quotes Psalms 34, 14, put, puts it in the Greek. Seek in Greek is zetio, zeto, zeto, z-e-t-e-o. To seek in order to find, to seek a thing. To seek in order to find out, and I like this, by thinking, meditating, reasoning, and inquiring. So there is this whole idea of seek it, you need to stop and meditate on it. Meditate, what does it mean to have peace? Am I really seeking out peace? And, is, is, and this goes back to the whole concept of holiness, which we'll get to that. Holiness says, I'm more than my base automatic reaction. I can stop, think about this, and transcend my automatic reaction and go, look, when someone comes at me, do I come back at them? But, or do I stop and realize, that's not the goal. I'm defeating myself, my own goal. I'm shooting myself in the foot because I want to speak to this person. I want to have a relationship with this person. So it actually says, stop, meditate, think about it, and then transcend. Do something different because you're not reaching your goal if when they come at you, you come at them. So seek peace, meditate on it. To seek after, seek for, aim at, strive after, require, once again, demand, Crave. You are to crave peace. I like this. Demand something from someone. Not only are you to seek peace, you are to say, we are to have peace. So as you can see, seek and pursue both have that. It's not just, oh, just go after it. Just kind of, it's oomph. There is oomph behind seeking it and procuring it and getting it and it's not just gonna fall into your lap, you gotta go get it. You gotta go obtain it. Of course, if God's saying that we can obtain it, it's obtainable. Now back to 1 Timothy. Oh no, uh, real quick. When it came to Psalms and Peter, also when it comes to pursue, Psalms uh, has pursue as Radef. Peter has it as Dioko. So, there's a direct correlation to Dioko. The Dioko is the Greek equivalent of Radif. So these are directly, these words that I'm giving you are directly linked. They're actually the corresponding words. So we are to pursue, and in 1 Timothy, it starts off with righteousness. Righteousness is in the Greek, and this is definitely what Dikaiosuni. D-I-K-A-I-O-S-U-N-E. So yeah, you'll have to come back and look at that one. What it says is, in the broad sense, state of him who is as he ought to be. Righteousness, the condition acceptable to God. The doctrine concerning the way in which a man may attain the state of approval of God. And this is where integrity. So we are to pursue integrity. We are to go after integrity, eagerly, eagerly pursue with hostility so as to acquire. Virtue, purity of life, rightness, and this, this I'm going to keep coming back to this one. Correctness of thinking, correctness of feeling, correctness of acting. And I'm going to be coming back to that one because that one that one means a lot because where do you get that? How do we get to where we have correct thinking, correct feeling, and correct acting? And for our, our society, 
it is very key to say correct feeling. Because in our society right now, we are basing so many decisions off of how we feel. That even in this, it's saying righteousness is finding the correct way to feel. You may not have the correct way to feel. And there is only one that can guide us to the correct way to feel. And basically what I boiled this down to is this is someone who is seeking to follow Torah. Righteousness is seeking to follow Torah. Another meaning is, uh, in a narrow sense, justice or the virtue which gives each his due. But the correct thinking, feeling, and acting, it is to follow God's precepts. He is the one that gives us the way to think. He is the one that gives us the way to feel. He is the one that gives us the way to act. And what this requires is submission. To have righteousness, you must be submitted. You must submit your thinking. You must submit your feeling. You must submit your acting so that he can give you correct thinking, correct feeling, and correct acting. And how do you find that? It is laid out here. And then you also go to him, one who follows Torah. Ah, I'm gonna, I get excited about that one. I'll, get, I'll get, come back. I'm going to steal my own thunder. <coughs> the next one is godliness, which is Eusebia. E-U-S-E-B-E-I-A. Eusebia, or I don't know. I'm sure I'm saying these all wrong. But what this means is reverence or respect. Piety toward God. Godliness. So basically, what are we to pursue in this case? We are to go after the fear of God. We are to go after the fact that God deserves respect. That we need to understand who He is and who we are in relation to Him. Amen. We are to pursue this with all we got. To be godly is to understand who we are in God. And to have respect and reverence for God. Next, faith or faithfulness. And you might recognize this word because it's been talked about. Pistis. P-I-S-T-I-S. Pistis. And first I'm going to give you the definition and then I'm going to talk about this links. This is one of those links back. And the thing is, it's not just my sermons, it's been his too. We've, we've been doing a series bouncing off of each other without even, I mean, it's God. It has to be. So, basically what it means, conviction of the truth of anything. Belief. In the New Testament, it is about a conviction or belief respecting man's relationship to God and divine things. Generally, with the uh, included idea of trust and holy fervor born of faith and joined with it uh, born of faith and joined with it, relating to God, the conviction that God exists and is the creator and ruler of all things, the provider and bestower of eternal salvation through Yeshua. Relating to Yeshua, a strong and welcome, and I like this, strong and welcome, strong and welcome conviction, a belief that Yeshua is the Messiah through whom we obtain eternal salvation in the knowledge of God. The religious belief in Yeshua Belief with the predominant idea of trust or confidence, whether in God or Yeshua, springing forth from faith in the same. So this idea of it, what we know. You really, I believe in God. I believe it exists. I believe He's in my life. I believe that He's actually intersecting my life. I believe Yeshua died so that I might actually know God the Father. This kind of belief. But then the last definition gets very interesting because I find this interesting. It's very short compared to all the other definitions, but all the other definitions hang off of this one. And that is fidelity, faithfulness, the character of one who can be relied upon. It's not just, yeah, I believe in God. Yeah, I believe in Yeshua. In the meaning itself, it also means you are going to be faithful. You are going to be reliable. You're going to be someone who can be relied on. And the thing is, it's kind of a dull, dull sort of thing, but we've talked about it, and this is what my dad has talked about. If you really have faith, you will be faithful. 
And faithfulness bears out your faith. You say you believe in God, you say you believe in His Word, you say you believe in His Son, then you will be faithful to act out that which is written here. You will be faithful to believe what He has told you and said, this is what I have for you, son or daughter. This is what I have for your life. You will be faithful to these things because you actually believe in Him. And when you're not, what you're saying is, I really don't believe you're going to get me through this. I really don't believe that you're going to, that, that I'm actually made for this. I really don't believe all this stuff. And the greatest example, Jericho. They were faithful to walk around that wall. They were faithful to do everything God said to do. Why? Because they actually learned to have faith that it didn't matter how crazy it sounded. I believe in God and what He told me to do. I believe in God and what He says. And because of that, I will be faithful to what He says. It's not enough to have, in our society's understanding, of faith. Because our society wants to take faith and say, well, I'll just have faith in God and sit here on my tuchus and see what happens. That's not Jericho. That's also not David with his army when he said, put on your armor and see what happens. And he heard the army go out and destroy the enemy. It's not that. Where do you see in Scripture, I will have faith and just sit here? Faith requires act action, which is where you see faithfulness. It's where Paul said, you say that I will have faith without works, and I say to you, I will show you my faith through my works. So, we are to pursue, we are to go after, we are to be eagerly, we should crave and desire to be one who is faithful because we believe in Him. We actually have a relationship with Him. We actually know that He's in our life. Next is love, agape. Everyone knows agape. Everyone's heard about agape. Brotherly love, affection, goodwill, love, benevolence. I find this one at love feasts. So this idea of getting together and having food together, which I'm totally for. <laughs> <laughs> but this is another topic. We keep bringing this one back up. It keeps coming back, this idea this concept that we need to love each other as brothers. I keep bringing up, it keeps coming back to, this is how they'll know you, that you love one another. This brotherly love. And in peace, the whole concept of, you can't have peace if you're not loving the other person. You can't have love if you're not seeking peace. Interconnected. So we keep bringing up agape. And I brought up last time, I, uh, I do believe, last time I read Colossians 3, 12 through 15, but we're going to read that again. And this is what Colossians 3, 12 through 15 is talking about. Therefore, and it's on page 1472, if you want to follow along. Sorry, I'm getting excited and just going for it. That is Colossians, yes? Yes. Colossians 3, 12 through 15. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with feelings, and there's that whole thing, right feelings, feelings of compassion, and with kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with one another. If anyone has a complaint against someone else, forgive him. Indeed, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must forgive. Above all these, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together perfectly. And let the shalom which comes from Messiah be your heart's decision maker, for this is why you were called to be part of a single body. Love is that which binds everything else together. You don't have love, it doesn't, it doesn't stay together. And there's this concept of unity. It's what, why you've been called to one body. It unites. It brings together. And, you know, I've talked about the sons of God that being called peacemakers, 
being called sons of God, sons of our Father, all having to do with understanding what it means to love, even in the face of someone who's spitting in your face. What it means to love in the midst of that. You will be son, a son of your Father. You will be son of God. And the fact that that is then tied to, it ties the body together, it unites, it brings together. Also, 1 Peter, let's look at that. 1 Peter 3, 8 through 9. I also use this in my sermon about peace because I was talking about Shalom being the decision maker. And the last one. And that is page 1518. So it shouldn't be too far away. 1 Peter, Peter 3, 8 through 9. <laughs> and I love this. It keeps, it keeps saying this in what we just read about righteousness, right thinking, right feeling, right acting. Finally, all of you be one in mind and feeling. Love as brothers and be compassionate and humble-minded, not repaying evil with evil or insult with insult, but on the contrary with blessing. For it is, this, uh, for it is to this that you have been called so that you may receive a blessing. So our calling is to love one another to the point that we can return a curse with a blessing. Which once again, this goes back to, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but this goes back to holiness. To be able to do that, you transcend what your natural man wants to do. And you seek holiness. Other. What is other? What is different? Holy as God is holy. Different. Next is steadfastness. And this one... This one is good too. Steadfastness or patience, which is hopomone. H-U-P-O-M-O-N-E. And what it means is obviously steadfastness. Consistency. We are to seek. We are to go after being consistent. And actually, Dad talked about it recently. The whole idea of you're not getting a different person here that you're getting if you come into my home than that the people at my home are not getting a different person at home. So we are to seek, we are to procure, we are to go after, we are to be eager to be consistent. Endurance, we've talked about that. The blessings that come if you can endure, if you can last in the midst, in the face of. And I love this, this next part is so awesome. It means, in the New Testament, the character of a man who is not swerved from his deliberate purpose and his loyalty to faith and piety by even the greatest trial and suffering. I'm going to say that again. Steadfastness. We are to go after steadfastness. And steadfastness is the character, and I'm just going to say of a person, the character of a person who is not swerved from their deliberate. The impetus is in them their deliberate purpose, and their loyalty to faith and piety, even in the face of greatest trials and sufferings. We are to seek to be that which says, it doesn't matter what's going on around me, it doesn't matter what you do, it doesn't matter any of that, I choose. And like I've been saying, I choose holiness. It doesn't matter what you do, I choose to not go off of my base reaction and to go off of that which God has me do. <coughs> I choose to allow God to guide me and have me transcend. So this idea of I will not be swerved from my, and I love that, my deliberate purpose. And once again, patiently, steadfastly. I lo love this one. A patient, steadfast waiting for. Now this one doesn't relate so much to dealing with other people. This has to do how many of us, on one side, we can't actually, we, there are those who can handle the guy in your face. They can be peaceful. They can do that. And they can choose the other. But then they're turning to God and going, so when are you going to do that thing? When, when, are, when are we going to have that thing you've been talking to me about all this time? When, when is that going to happen? How many of us get to a place where the reason we swerve is not what's happening in our life, it's what's not happening in our life. 
The reason we swerve is because we, we've been waiting on God, but he didn't follow our timetable. And so we're going to go off by ourselves and try to get it to happen anyway. <laughs> so, steadfastness is also this understanding of patiently, steadfastly waiting for. Saying to God, you know what? It doesn't matter how long you will take. I will be steadfast to the vision. I will be steadfast to what you've told me is going to happen. It's Avraham. When, are, when am I going to have children? When, when is this going to happen? But his mentality was, it doesn't matter. I will stay steadfast. Now, he worked at it. It's very obvious in the scripture. He had to work at it. And that's the thing. We are to pursue it. It is work. You have to go get it. You have to go obtain it. It's not just going to drop into your spirit. You've got to go grab it. You got to go show God, I'm willing and I will keep trying to wait until God goes, good job. Glad you waited because here you go. And if you notice, it keeps coming back around. We have this mentality in this nation that the impetus all resides in God. When God keeps saying in the scripture, no, 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 that's not how this works. The impetus draw, draws from you. You show me that you are actually going to pursue this. You show me you actually will do this. Watch what happens. Now you might have to wait. You may have to patiently wait. But watch what happens. Once again, it's David. Go put on your armor. He put on his armor. He didn't have to do any battle. It's that faith, that faithfulness. And it's interesting, the steadfast and the faithfulness kind of right there is like how do you really differentiate the two. But, and that's the thing, a lot of these are that way. A patient, enduring, sustaining, persevering. It says over and over, and we've studied, talking about in the Revelation, those who persevere, what? It's this. It's that steadfastness, that understanding, I will not swerve, no matter what's going on around me, no matter what everybody else is doing, no matter, that is not where, where my impetus lies. My, it doesn't lie in my circumstances. It doesn't lie in what everyone else is doing around me. It lies in my faith in God. That's where it lies. And that's where it will stay. And I will deliberately function from that place. And lastly, in, in 1 Timothy, is gentleness or meekness, which is uh, preotes, P-R-A-O-T-E-S. Which, it just, that one's very simple. Gentleness, mildness, meekness. But, we've been talking about that too. For peace, and for love, and I actually did a sermon on loving our enemies. That's one of the ones that I brought up recently. I've said it over and over. A soft answer turns away wrath that keeps coming back. That's this. Be gentle. Be meek. We'll be seeing another scripture here soon that says, it actually says it. It says, be gentle to your opponent. For they may actually come to their senses and follow God. Now, let's look at 2 Timothy. Which is... 2 Timothy 2. Uh, 2.22. Which would be on page one, uh, 1487. And go to page 1488. And I'm going to read 22 and then I'm going to uh, read, read beyond that because once again we have some context that's very interesting. Bless you. And it says, So flee the passions of youth. Does that sound like entitlement at all? Well, we've talked about the passions of youth. I want. Give to me. I must have. Flee the passions of youth. youth and along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart, so these things are connected to a pure heart, pursue righteousness faithfulness, love, and peace. But stay away from stupid and ignorant controversies. There it is again. Let's not get into useless arguments. You know that all they lead to is fights, and a slave of the Lord shouldn't fight. On the contrary, he should be kind to everyone, a good teacher, 
And this one we really need in this. And not resentful when mistreated. Also, he should be gentle as he corrects his opponents. Here we go. For God may perhaps grant them the opportunity to turn from their sins, acquire full knowledge of the truth, come to their senses, and escape the trap of the adversary after having been captured alive by him to do his will. So, controversies are in contrary to what we are to pursue. And not only that, we are to be gentle with those who we are dealing with. And this reminds me that I did that sermon about being kind and loving in the middle of trying to present truth. That whole thing of uh, holiness, piety, or pride. And the fact that we don't need to be dealing with people with our nose in the air and saying, you know, you should be doing this. I'm keeping kosher. Why are you keeping kosher? And talking about how that's not going to get you anywhere. And actually, I brought up in that sermon, and what's interesting is, this kind of goes both ways. If there's some of it that has to do with timing. If they're not ready, it talks about, don't, ter bleh, don't toss pearls before swine. I'm not saying that they're swine. That's not where I'm going with this. <laughs> but it says, because they may beat it down into the ground, and turn and attack you. Basically with the concept of, it's pearls. It's valuable information. But by choosing an incorrect time, and actually, if you're doing it haughtily and with a gruff spirit instead of a gentle spirit, you've just taken that valuable information. They will not value it. They will actually lower its value. The value will be lowered in their estimation. And then they will turn and attack you. You will get into an unnecessary battle. When that was never the goal. The goal was to actually present truth and love. It was never to get in a fight. So it's important. And the thing is, think about this. You just created a situation where the Word of God just got devalued. That is never a good situation. And the thing is, actually, if we will follow these things that we are to pursue, if we are to be gentle, be loving, faithful, and kind, and so on, when they come at us, like I said, if we can meditate upon, stop and think about, when they come at us and go, I'm not going to go off of my base nature. I choose that which is different, that which is of God, and do something different and be at peace. When they come at us and we respond in a peaceful manner, it says so much. It speaks of God. It speaks of His character. It speaks of strength. And it actually gives validity to what you are saying. Whereas if you react like they react, the validity goes out the window. The pearls get stamped into the ground. Now, pursue Dioko, same thing. Go after this with all you got. Go get it. Eagerly pursue. Righteousness, same word. Right thinking right feeling, right acting. Go pursue how you are to act, how you are to think, and how you are to feel in any situation. Stop using the situation as your determinant. Go get from God how are you to think, how are you to feel, and how are you to act in this situation. Stop using society. Stop using everybody else. Stop using your situation. You need to go to God. Faith and faithfulness. Same thing. Pistis. P-I-S-T-I-S. Whole idea. You really believe in God? You will follow through. You'll actually do these things. Love, agape. We must seek out that which will bind us and unite us. And finally, peace. And this is really the peace I was talking about last week. Is in, he, uh, in the Greek is irene. E-I-R-E-N-E. -E. And I find, I find the definition interesting. A state of a nation in tranquility. Because if you actually have people who are at peace, you can actually get a nation who is at peace. Exemption from rage and havoc of war. Peace between individuals, harmony and concord. I like this one. Security, safety, prosperity, felicity. Because...
peace and harmony make and keep things safe and prosperous. To have prosperity, to have safety, you must seek out peace. And it's interesting, I read the scripture last time that says, my peace, my shalom, the shalom that I put in you, allowing that to be your decision maker, will keep your mind and heart safe. It's right there. And I talked about the fact, because I will show you how to rightly think, how to rightly feel, and how to rightly act. Therefore, you won't invest your mind and your heart in something that has no return. I will have you invest in that which has a return, which is love, peace, kindness, gentleness. So peace keeps things safe. Of the Messiah, the way that leads to peace or salvation. Of Yeshua, the tranquil state of a soul assured of salvation through Yeshua. And so, and I, this is interesting, so fearing nothing from God. Take note of that. And content with its earthly lot, whatsoever it may be. And that's the thing. We think about this. So peace. Peace obviously is in contradiction to fear. But we think, oh, God will come and chase away my fears. But it's always this, God will chase away my fears out there. The stuff out there I'm afraid about. But let's, let's be honest for a minute here. And I'm going to be honest with you too. Is that really what we're fearing most of the time as believers? Is that really the fear that we face most of the time? I know it's not for me. What I've noticed that I fear the most is what is God going to do in my life? What's going to be changed? What's He going to take away? What's it going to take for me to actually commit to this? Can I get an amen on being there? Anyone ever been there? So this peace, peace has a relation to not fearing what God will bring into your life. Not fearing what God's going to have in your life. This understanding that God's good and He won't do anything to harm me. And then being okay with saying, you know what, my lot, where God has me, my life right now, I'm okay with it. I'm okay with where, where God has me. I'm okay with what God's bringing in life and, and what He's taking away. So not fearing God. If you will not fear God. It's interesting. There's a song that coined in a su such an uh, interesting way. They said, having a deophobic mind. The fear of a deity, of a God who can direct your life. We are not to have deophobic mentality. We are not to fear what God's going to do. So if we want peace, if we really want peace, we submit. We let go. We say, you tell me how to think. You tell me how to feel. You tell me how to act. And I won't be afraid of what you're going to be doing for that. And then you will have peace. If you stop fearing what God's going to do in your life, you will have peace. And if you say, I'm okay with where my life is right now, and that goes back to, I purposely say, it doesn't matter what's going on. It doesn't matter what other people are doing. It doesn't matter. I choose to be in God and have Him tell me how to think, feel, and act. When you say, my lot is okay because God is with me. Instead of saying, and this goes into that entitlement thing. Instead of saying, I demand from you, God, this A, B, C, D, and if you don't do it the way I want, I'm going to be mad at you. <laughs> but that's what we do. That's not going to bring you peace. That's only going to bring you heartache. Yep. And this is interesting, too. The blessed state of devout and upright men after death. The pursuit of peace. And this is the only one that has this concept. The pursuit of peace doesn't just stay here. It is the afterlife. And my father just brought this up. He didn't know what I had written down. But he just brought this up about uh, talking about the DDK and this concept of peace being that which benefits you now and in the afterlife. It's actually built into the Word. This idea that seeking peace, seeking these things, seeking the ways of God benefits you now, but is that which will lead you into peace after. And actually, 
turn it around. If you do not seek these things, there won't be peace after. Seek them now. May, that they may benefit you now. But understand, it is that which opens the door for you to have the peace in the next chapter of all this. It is that which resides here and there at the same time. Also, um, 1 Peter 3 and the Psalms 34, 14, that whole comparison so that you can actually see uh, what the words are. Psalms, Shalom. And 1 Peter, Irene. So, Irene is the Greek, compare, uh, Greek uh, equivalent of Shalom, the destruction of the one who creates chaos. thing is I'm going through my notes and I put I put blurbs at the end but I've already already said what my blurbs are <laughs> now let's get to a scripture that I am I get really excited over Hebrews 12 is where we're going to be going We're going to be looking at Hebrews 12, 11 and Hebrews 12, 14. But what's interesting, and here we go with those connections, I used Hebrews 12 in my message about bitterness. That was one of the main things I used in that particular sermon. And I used it to, because what it says is you can't have bitter water and sweet water coming from the same spring. You can't have grapes coming from a fig tree or figs from a grapevine. You're going to have one or the other. So I was using that about, uh, about the warning about, uh, about uh, being bitter and that there's actually that warning to not be bitter. But it also goes on and talks about discipline. And I pointed out bitterness, what bitterness, what brings on bitterness is hitting a trial, hitting something, a wall in your life. And interestingly enough, it, it's going in opposition to peace. You're not accepting your lot. That wall that you just hit, that person that just insulted you, all of those things, the things that God allowed to happen in your life. You hit that wall, and instead of saying, you know what, it's good. God's with me. I accept this in my life to have peace. Instead, you hit that, and you become a victim of it and you accept that victim mentality, and that wall becomes then that which can be built around that wall, and it becomes a prison. And everything you see in your life is seen through the window of that prison. Everything that you observe or see is seen through, through that place. So instead of saying, you know what, if this happened, God allowed this to happen, and there is a reason, it also it fights against steadfastness. You have swerved. Instead of saying, I will not swerve, regardless of the trial or the abuse. You're resenting being mistreated, which it just said. Those of God should not resent being mistreated. Trust me, that's a hard one. It really is. But you hit that wall, and then you become imprisoned by it instead of seeing it as, because it talks about discipline, and not discipline like paddling discipline, not discipline like that. It's actually, if you look at the context, it's talking about discipline, and the, the comparison I gave is like, if you want to be Batman, you see how much discipline he put his mind and his body through to actually do what needs to be done? It's that kind, that getting yourself ready and strong. So you're imprisoned by the wall instead of realizing, this is something for me to scale, and get over, get through, and thus become stronger and get to the next platform. Because if you're gonna to get to the next platform, you're gonna hit a wall, and you're gonna to have to get over it. And that's the thing that's interesting with bitterness, hey, get over it, but not out of dismissing. No, we wanna encourage you, let's get over it. Let's get beyond it. Let's realize that you aren't this wall. That's not your identity. Your identity is one who climbs the wall and gets out. 
Your identity is not one who is imprisoned. It's one who gets out of the prison. So I use this scripture um, for that. And I do find it interesting. I'm just now linking the fact that that goes against peace. You're not accepting what's happening in your life. You're, you're bucking against it, saying this is not fair, this is not, how dare you God, ultimately, how dare you God even bring this into my life? And then it's also not, it's not steadfastness because you're allowing a trial in your life to get you off course. Instead of saying, no, this is something for me to scale, something for me to be strengthened. All right, Hebrews 12:11. And understand, I say all of that with the understanding that scaling that wall is not easy. But at the same time, it's not supposed to be. If it were easy, you wouldn't get stronger. It has to be discipline. Now, all discipline, while it is happening, does indeed seem painful, not enjoyable. So if it were easy, it would, it would be enjoyable, or, or at least it wouldn't get on the radar. This needs to get on the radar. But for those who have been trained by it, so those who allow it, and this is where I get really excited, it later produces its peaceable fruit, which is righteousness. Do you see what's happening in this scripture right here? We've got a triple play. We are to pursue what? Steadfastness. Well, if you allow discipline in your life and are trained by it, you are being steadfast. Which then allows what? Peaceable fruit. You are to pursue peace. But what is this peaceable fruit? Righteousness. Triple play. And this is where we get to the thing that one leads into the next, which leads into the next. And you start, if you lose your sight of righteousness, you'll lose your sight of peace. You'll lose your sight of love. If you use, lose your sight of peace, same thing. You'll lose sight of all these things. You must pursue them all and with all your heart or you will lose them because they are so interlinked that you ultimately can't separate them. They feed into each other. Like a, like a circuit, that's what I said, closed circuit, exactly. My mother actually brought it up in a good, good analogy and I think this is an appropriate time to use it. She says it's like a car. A car is a closed system. And you have to have the spark plug that starts the engine, that gets it going. But if you follow it through, as the engine is going and it's then charging a battery, now that battery keeps that energy and there's a wire that goes back to the spark plug. If you're missing any of the parts, the engine won't run. And all those parts make the, the car move forward. And my mother put it this way, it's like we have a car and all the parts and pieces are there, but it's all a part, it's all in pieces and we can pick up each piece and go, righteousness, peace, love. And we talk about it. And we talk about it, and we talk about it, and we talk about it. But we're not assembling the car, so we're not going to get anywhere. We talk about getting to point B through this awesome car that we have, but the car's not even built. It's in a warehouse somewhere. We are called to actually put the car together, put some gasoline in that car, turn the key, and start driving. Stop talking about the parts and pieces and go, oh, look, I've got this great block. It's awesome. It's going to make this car run so well. Oh, and look at this transmission. It's going to make it go so much faster. And these, these spark plugs, they're guaranteed to stay clean for years. Isn't it amazing? And God's going, so what? <laughs> yeah, wow. Get it together and get going. There's a song that I like also that says... Um, Basically, stop staring at the east and start moving that way. So there's this idea. It's not enough to talk about these things. But anyway, in this triple play. So if you are steadfast, you will then produce peaceable fruit. So righteousness, the right way of thinking, the right way of feeling, the right way of acting brings forth peace. And that's the thing, peaceable actually has in it, it's irinokos, E-I-R-E-N-I-K-O-S, which you can obviously see the connection to E-I-R-E-N, 
E. But relating to peace. Peaceable, pacific, loving peace. This is the part I love. Bringing peace with it. Righteousness is peaceable. Righteousness brings peace with it. If you can get to a place where you are submitted unto God and say, I give you my thinking, I give you my feeling, I give you my acting, and it doesn't matter what you do or you do or you do towards me, otherwise, it doesn't matter what society is doing, it doesn't matter what my situation is, if that is not my impetus, but instead I am submitted unto God for the way to think, the way to feel, and the way to act, it brings peace with it. Everything will be falling apart. Everything will be raging. Everything will be chaotic. And if you look to Him to how to think, how to feel, and how to act, you will be at peace. Mm-hmm. And what that requires is to be steadfast and allow discipline to do its work. And to be at peace and say everything is okay with whatever comes into my life. Do you, do you see... You see how, as I've been studying this, it's like this feeds into that, which feeds into this, which feeds into that, and this, this, this binding. And one thing that was talked about, and I've talked a lot about this one because it was just like, I'm finding all this stuff, I'm finding, I've been talking about pretty much things that are so interlinked you can't get them apart. When you've got something like this, when it's so integral and so together, in science that's called a matrix. And what a matrix does is it actually sets the foundation for something else. These things are not things that are optional. These things are things that are foundational. These are things that we must be pursuing, we must be going after, we must seek to obtain with everything we have, or we will never achieve that which God has been wanting for this body from the very beginning. These are things that we cannot ignore, we must go after. Or else we will never represent that which God has built us to represent as a community. And how much of this that is foundational have we been ignoring? Do we avoid confrontation and word battles in favor of peace? And I'm talking also, I want to talk about the Messianic Jewish community specifically. We are an argumentative, cantankerous, stiff necked people (laughs) that demand you must do it my way or I will present you with hate. This is not something of them out there. This is not even something about the rest of the body. This is something about our own movement. We have been misrepresenting God. Do you understand the weight of that? And like I said, This morning, God's convicting me of these things I am not doing. I have been misrepresenting God. And I've talked about this. If you seek peace, if you're able to give blessing in the midst of cursing, you bring something that reverses a cycle. You actually have a redemptive effect on your surroundings. We aren't supposed to get caught up in what the surroundings are new because all that is is degradation. All that is is entropy. What we are called to do is bring a power that actually reverses the situation. We are to bring holiness, that which is other, that which is opposite, that which goes against. So, right thinking, right feeling, right action. That which we get from God and God alone will bring forth peace. And not only that, it's peaceable fruit. So, once again, my dad's sermon on what are we to do if we actually want to make it into the peace that I was talking about in the afterlife, the peace that we're talking about, what are we to do? We have to produce fruit. It's right there. Righteousness is peaceable fruit. 
You go after Torah. You go after the right way of thinking, the right way of feeling, the right way of acting. And you will produce fruit. And it won't only be here. It will be there. Now our sight should not be on there completely. It should be on restoring the world. That's the point. But it will be there. 14 says this. Keep pursuing, and I didn't even read this. I read this before, but I didn't. I could have gone so well in the, the peace, peace sermon. Keep pursuing shalom with everyone and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Everyone. So, pursuing, it's daioko. It's the same one. It's go after with everything you got. Go after with hostility. Go after it with eagerness to obtain. Go get it. Let's keep on, shall we? Let's keep pursuing peace. Not fearing what God's going to bring into our life. Peace with those around us. Acceptance of our life. Instead of, and the things we talked about recently too, about complaining. <laughs> complaining leads, what does the DK say? Complaining leads to, uh, uh, leads to blasphemy. Because we are saying to God, how dare you even bring this into my life? I will complain to such a point, and you can get to a place where you complain, complain, until finally it will root back to God. How, how could you let this happen? Ah. And I talked about that in bitterness. Bitterness leads there to where you're finally bitter toward God. How dare you even have this in my life? But you want peace? This is saying you want peace? You accept it. You use it as discipline. You let it do its work. You let it do train you, let it strengthen you, get over it, and get through, you will have peace. And all of that, you will, you will have righteousness. And here it's saying pursue holiness as well. And like I said, I keep bringing up, I brought up holiness and this idea that holiness what the sermon was about was we have in our society, there's always this, and with new generations, there's this desire, I want to be different. I want to be contrary. I don't want to be, I want to be countercultural. But if you really break down what they're doing, it's the same thing that their parents did years before. It's the same thing again and again and again. And everyone wants to be so different that they're like the guy next to them. It doesn't work. In human, human terms, you can't be different. It always goes back. The only way, the only way to truly be different is to seek holiness, to be holy as God is holy. Because what holiness says is you've been given a mind that goes beyond your base nature, and when your base nature raises its head, you say, no, I'm not going to go with my base nature, I'm going to transcend my base nature and go counter to my base nature. And I've been given through God that ability. And the only way to truly be different, because God is different. Holiness means other, completely other. The only way to be different is holy as God is holy. And to say, when someone curses me to my face, I will turn around and say, God loves you. May God be with you. May God love on you. May you feel his arms around you. May you hear his words to you. I'm sorry, that's different. Every person, I'm going countercultural, man, counter, all this kind of stuff. You go to the highest person in politics who's not a believer. You go to the lowest person. You cuss them out. The likelihood is they're going to turn around and cuss you out too. It doesn't matter their positioning. They're being countercultural. It's humanity going against humanity. That's all it is. It's not different. And the cycle continues, and it goes on, and each plays their part, and it just degrades more and more, and everybody just takes their fists and punch each other in the face <laughs> until humanity is just beaten to a pulp, and there's nothing left. It's not, you're not changing anything. You're just continuing it, perpetuating it, and it doesn't change. You really want things to change? You really want something different? You really want that? Seek holiness. 
seek to say, I'm going to be different by saying, I love you. You can stab me again and again with your words and with your ways, but I will say, I love you. Because there was a man who came, who took two nails, third nail there, a spear in the side, that said, I'm going to be different. And even as you kill me, I'm going to say, Lord, forgive them for they know not what they do. That is what changes the cycle. That is what reverses it and brings restore, restorative. And that's the thing. Degradation has a stopping point. There will be a time where it all ends. Restoration is eternal. Once it gets going, if you can stay in it, if you can pursue it, if you can hold on to it, if you can stay with God, it will continue and never stop. And this is that whole thing. Love leads to peace. Peace leads to righteousness. Righteousness leads to just, I mean, all of it. They tie into each other. And we will see change. We have so many, and I'm speaking now to my generation, we have so many going, change, 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 change. What are you willing to do to actually see change? Oh, I'm willing to fight, I'm willing to rail, I'm willing to make a sign. I'm willing to cuss them out. I'm willing to do all these different things. For some, I'm willing to break the law to the point that I wreck my own life. I'm willing to do all these different things. How is that changing anything? That isn't changing anything. That is just another form of the same thing. It's corruption, but in a different style. What are you willing to do to actually see change? Are you willing to say out of love, I will lay down and let God instead of let me? Now, does it mean you don't speak? No. That means you speak in love. Does it mean you don't try to fight injustices? No. But you leave it to God to be the one who brings vengeance and vindication. Now, I preached about that one too because I have to deal with the fact that I want to vindicate myself all the time. Yeah. What are we doing to actually be different, truly counter? The only way is through holiness. So we are to seek, we are to pursue, to be holy, and to say, I'm going to go counter to what my natural man would want to do. And that's the thing I, I talked about. I actually talked about in bitterness. And I'll keep going back to this, the holiness and so on. Holiness and bitterness and all that. All of it ties so, they're so intertwined. It actually is stronger and it is braver to say, I am going to love and I'm going to be gentle. And I'm going to be kind, even as you are not kind or gentle to me. Because that is open that is you're being exposed you're allowing yourself to be exposed and saying it's okay I accept this so as I so to open the door for me to love for me to love on you once again that's what Yeshua did I'm gonna stand here I'm not going you're accusing me of all these different things I'm not going to come against it. I'm not going to rail against it. You're going to do what you're going to do. And that's the thing. Yeshua was like, you've made up your mind. You've made up your mind. Now, I could call on the angels. I could call on God. I could call on all of this because I am righteous. But I'm not going to because this has to do with relationship. This has to do with our relationship. You've already made up your mind. You've already decided. And I'm just going to stand here and I will take it because I love you and I want to open the door so that I might actually get to you and talk to you so that you might understand me and receive me. I will sit here and take it. Now, in a relational situation, does that mean you never bring up the fact that you're hurting me? No. But you say in those relationships, but I'm sticking around. And I'm still going to love you. I'm still going to pray for you. I'm still going to be here for you. When you have a crisis and you come, I'll still be here. But you need to be aware you're hurting me but I'm still here. I'm not packing my bags and leaving because I want to love.
because I want to be open, because I will accept this so as to have the opportunity to love you. Proverbs 15.9 Once again, I use Proverbs 15 in my message talking about lovingly uh, lovingly presenting truth. And when I, what I used was 15.4 which says, and this is uh, page 962, but uh, 15.4 says, a soothing tongue is a tree of life, but when it twists things, it breaks the spirit. And my, my point was, let's have a soothing tongue. The whole concept of soft answer turns away wrath. Let's have a soothing tongue. So I used this. I used this before, and now I'm here again. 15.9 says, Adonai detests the way of the wicked, but loves anyone who pursues righteousness. Same thing. It's radif. We have rather fear, that pursuit with the understanding, of, I must obtain this. I must obtain right thinking, right feeling, and right acting. And we've already established that those things are not based on what's around us. They're not based on the other person. They're not based on our feelings. They're not based on our human nature. They're not based on society. They are based on Torah and the one who presented Torah. So pursue right thinking, right feeling, right acting. Radif translates to sadaka, which you should all be familiar with that word, sadaka. Transliterated T-S-A-D-A-Q-A-H. Means justice, righteousness, rightness in government, which is interesting. So we are to seek to have a non-corrupt government, but it is through God that we do that in His ways. Righteousness of judges, righteousness of rule, king, of law, of Davidic king, Messiah. So righteousness comes through Messiah. Righteousness of God's attributes. Right thinking, right feeling, right acting. Acting. We have talked about this. We are to take on the mind of Yeshua. We are to take on His mind. It is of God. It is His essence. Righteousness is of Him. We are to take on His name, His namesake, who He is. So right thinking, right feeling, right acting comes from Him. Righteousness in case of cause. Truthfulness. I find this interesting. Righteousness is linked with truthfulness. And that's the thing. When you're using the basis of what the other people are doing, if you're using the basis of how you see society, if you're using the basis of, this is all, all shadowed by human perception. Who is it that sees beyond human perception. God. We are to go to Him and say, this is how I'm perceiving things. This is how I'm feeling things. There's some who even say, this is how I feel they feel about me. <laughs> because I feel that they feel this about me, I'm going to react. Which, by the way, doesn't tend to lead to peace. It actually is contrary to that. But as we go to Him, He gives us the truth. Here's how you're seeing things, son or daughter, but this is the truth, and this is how you're to think about it. This is what you're feeling, son or daughter, but this is the truth, and this is how you should feel about it. And this is how you've been acting, but this is the truth, and this is what you're supposed to do about it. Instead of, like I said, just going with your base, let's choose holiness. Ethically right. Righteousness as in vindication, justification, salvation of God. And this is interesting, the vindication of God. The whole idea that righteousness comes from God bringing justice. God being the one who vindicates. God the one who sees if you're being unjustly tried and saying, you know what, I'll take care of it. Yosef, Joseph, God saw. And he had to be steadfast and patiently wait for God, for God to bring vindication and justice for him. He did not fight everyone around him to get it. Instead, he said, 
Instead, he sought peace by saying, my lot, this is my lot, I accept it. What can God do with me here? Even being put in prison. He didn't, he sought peace by saying, I will choose peace. What can God do? And God, what did it say about peace? By seeking peace, he was safe and he prospered. Peace brings forth safety and prosperity. So he chose peace. He was steadfast. He was, did not swerve based on his situation. And he waited. And God brought vindication, justification, and salvation. And once again, prosperity of people, and the righteousness of acts. If you get all the rest, you will start acting rightly. This goes back to the faithfulness. If you got faith, you will act faithfully. We will see it. Obviously, this righteousness has a connection to the righteousness in Greek. And about pursuing peace, let's go to James 3, 18. And what's interesting, we're going to read all of James, but I used this one um, in my sermon about bitterness because, actually, I think this was the one that I was talking about, the, uh, the spring bitter and uh, the fruit. Ah, I got that mixed up last time. Whoops. Hebrews was something else. Uh, just three. Uh. Oh, yeah, Hebrews was about the discipline. James 3, and let's read it, which is page 1512. It says, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, since you know that we will be judged more severely. For we all stumble in many ways. If someone does not stumble in what he says, he is a mature man who can bridle his whole body. If we put a bit in a horse's mouth to make it obey us, we control its whole body as well. And think of a ship. Although it is huge and is driven by strong winds, yet the pilot can steer it wherever he wants with just a small rudder. So too the tongue is a tiny part of the body, yet it boasts great things. So how a little fire sets a whole forest ablaze. Yes, the tongue is a fire, a world of wickedness. The tongue is so placed in the body that it defiles every part of it, setting ablaze the whole of our life. And we've recently been talking about let's not complain. Let's not complain. Let's not gossip. We've talked about that. These are the fires that can defile your whole body. And it is set on fire by Gehinom itself. For people have tamed and continue to tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures. But the tongue no one can tame. It is an unstable and evil thing, full of death-dealing poison. With it we bless Adonai, the Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the image of God. Out of the same mouth come blessings and cursings. Brothers, it isn't right for these things, uh, right for these things to be, right for these things, huh? brothers, it is, isn't right for these things to be this way. And right here, I use this talking about the fact that we need to actually bless our enemies. We need to be fighting for their souls now. And I brought up the whole concept of, isn't it a better thing to call them enemy and then later to call them brother instead of having to face them on a battlefield? And to actually say, you know what? They lost, but we won because you came over here, because you know God, because we are brothers. So there's this whole concept of cursing and blessing should not be coming from the same mouth. Out of the same mouth come... Oh, okay. A spring doesn't send both fresh and bitter water from the same opening, does it? Can a fig tree yield olives, my brother, or a grapevine figs? Neither does salt water produce fresh. Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him demonstrate it by his good way of life. Here we go. Faithfulness by actions done in humility that grows out of wisdom. But if you harbor in your heart bitter jealousy 
and selfish ambition. Don't boast and attack the truth with lies. This wisdom is not the kind that comes from above. On the contrary, it is worldly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where there are jealousy and selfish ambitions, there will be disharmony in every foul practice. But the wisdom from above is, first of all, pure, then peaceful, kind, open to reason, full of mercy, and good fruits. There's those fruits. Without partiality and without hypocrisy. We just talked about in the DDK not being partial based on things that may sway you, not being partial with your judgment. It's saying right here that the ways of wisdom are without partiality and without hypocrisy. And peacemakers who sow seeds in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. There it is again. Righteousness is a peaceable fruit. Peacemakers, which we read before, will be blessed by being called sons and daughters of God, which means you are someone who understands how to love. Peacemakers who sow seed in peace raise up a harvest of right thinking, right feeling, and right acting. So, we have here so much. <laughs> but I really wanted to focus on the peacemakers whose seed is peace, raise up a harvest of righteousness. We also have the whole thing about the tongue. I brought up in the whole, the whole sermon about um, the whole sermon about peace that it has to do with how we interact with each other. We have talked about that over and over again, about how we interact with one another, and that being important. And lastly, I want to take us to Romans 14. Now, real quickly about Romans, it's talking about something that I'm not going to really address because I don't really have all the parts and pieces. I still need to study it. But suffice it to say, they were talking about, there was an argument over what should be eaten and what shouldn't be eaten. And um, by this, we're not saying kosher or unkosher. By Jewish standards, food, what's unkosher is not even considered food. It's like saying, hey, let's go eat turkey buzzard. Uh, that's not food. You don't even consider that food. It's not even in your sphere of understanding food. So when they say in here, when you read it all and so on, when it says eat anything, it's talking about eat anything that's food. That would be considered food. So eat anything kosher. Actually, it's the whole thing about should we eat meats or not. And once again, I don't have all the parts and pieces. I need to study it out myself. But that's not my point. So 14.1, which is 14.18, it says, Now as for a person whose trust is weak, welcome him but not to get into arguments over opinions. Once again, there's this whole thing of let's not get into arguments. Let's seek peace. 14.15 says, And if your brother is being upset by the food you eat, your life is no longer one of love. Do not by your eating habits destroy someone for whom the Messiah died. Once again, this goes back to speaking in love. Let's do things in love and not in, I'm doing this better than you are. Because all you're doing is destroying one who could know the truth. And that defeats the point. From there, 16, don't let what you know to be good be spoken of as bad. For the kingdom of God is not eating or drinking, but righteousness, shalom, and the joy of the Ruach HaKodesh. So the kingdom is the right thinking, right feeling and right acting. That is the kingdom. The kingdom is peace, is seeking out peace, and the kingdom is the joy of the Ruach HaKodesh, which the way I think of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Ruach HaKodesh is that which, um, that which reveals truth. It reveals truth. We should be more concerned with the fact, not that we were right, and not that we were vindicated, but more concerned with the fact that that person just found truth and take joy in the Ruach HaKodesh. Not only that, that as they have found truth, it is evidence that they know the Ruach HaKodesh and that they are going to have a relationship. This is what we should take joy in. And then finally, 19. 
So then, let us pursue the things that make for shalom and mutual up, up building. Once again, it's Dioko and Rene. Let us pursue. Let's go after with everything that we have. Shalom. Peace. So we are to pursue righteousness, right thinking, right feeling, right acting, gen uh, godliness, the understanding of who we are in God and who God is in relation to us, reverence. We are to pursue with everything reverence toward God. We are to pursue faithfulness, faith in God to such a point that we are faithful. Love, that which binds us and actually allows us to be one body and to move as one. Steadfastness, that which will make us not swerve in the face of anything, but that which allows us to wait upon the Lord. Gentleness, that which will allow us to be heard because we are gentle with our opponents. Peace and holiness, that which is other. For the kingdom is righteousness, it is shalom, and it is the joy of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Lord God, Lord, I pray that now that we've laid out the parts of the car, that we would not just stand and look at it. Instead, Lord God, we offer you our hands, offer our minds and our spirit, and we, we know that through your grace, you'll give us the tools, help us to build the car. And Lord God, I pray that we would build the car individually, but we'd also build the car as a community. And we will get this car going, and the thing is, I pray then that we would invite you to take the seat, take the wheel, and get us to point B. Oh God, we thank you. We thank you that your word has this dynamic in it of one thing leading into another, supporting another. Oh God, it, there's something unspoken. May we seek that part that's unspoken because that's where your power is. And may we pursue, truly pursue these things. In Yeshua's name I pray. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Yevarech Adonai v'yishmarecha Yair Adonai p'nav alecha In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, our Lord, our righteousness, our salvation, the Prince of Peace. Amen.